I was born in a hospital, Grace Hospital, in Hutchinson, Kansas. Not, I was not born in my parents' home. A lot of people my age were born in their parents' home. We had a conversation about that the other day, and I was one of the few that was born in a hospital. was a room at the entrance to the school, just like this one, where there were shelves. You'd put your dinner bucket up on the shelves. There were, of course, no noontime prepared meals. Everybody brought their own in a lunch bucket. So that's where the lunch buckets were kept. Uh, there was exercise equipment, like here they have jump ropes, and uh, we probably had a uh, place to put our ball gloves and bats and balls, because we, we played baseball or softball during recesses. Recesses were, I guess, 15 minutes long, one in the morning and one in the afternoon with an hour off for lunch. So after we had eaten our lunch, we could go out and play in the schoolyard. The schoolyard was probably an acre in size. There was no indoor plumbing, uh, no running water for sinks or faucets, and of course no indoor toilet facility. I went to a school that was very similar to this for two years, and then a new school was built on the same site. So by third through eighth grade, I went to the newer school. This school, the one like this, I remember that our row of desks was right along here on this side and the upper grades were over here on the far side. Uh, there were benches, long benches like, like this across the front for recitation and I think I learned more from listening to the recitations of the other classes, particularly of the upper grades, than I did by doing work that we had been assigned to do in the first and second grades. You know, you're in the same room, you hear this information being exchanged between the students and between the students and the teacher and you learn it. So you were learning eighth grade stuff when you were in the first grade in a sense, some of it at least. Number of kids probably it varied 20, 30, high 30s maybe at the, at the most. Uh, the school itself, the first two years, was a wood frame school, the old country school type that you would envision, one room, one teacher, and uh, then we built, uh, the school district built a nice new grade school brick building, two rooms, indoor plumbing, 
a basement complete with the kitchen and uh, uh, regular th heating system controlled by a thermostat. We were done with uh, wood stoves then. We had wood stoves those first years in the old country grade school. And uh, the old country grade school also had two outhouses, one for the boys, one for the girls, off in the corner of the lot somewhere. And it was a piece of land that somebody had donated back when the school first started, probably in the uh, late 1800s. And uh, Probably an acre of land, I'm going to guess, maybe two acres. I've never really thought about how, many, how big it was, but, you know, it was, we had enough space there to play softball. And I was five years old when I started grade school in the country. Country school uh, in McPherson County. They had the schools divided up by districts, and we were District 39, and that was known as Alpha Grade School. And so I don't remember too much about those first five years before I started grade school. The, my sister was born five years after I was. Uh, I, I can remember I had my tonsils taken out before I started grade school, or just about the time I started grade school. Uh, so, eight years of grade school out in the country, and I, we were, what, a mile and three quarters from the grade school to our farm. So did you take a bus? I'm sorry. Did you take a bus to school? No, there were there were no buses. How? How'd you get to school then? Well, sometimes one of my parents would take me. Sometimes we would I would walk. Sometimes uh, I'd ride my bicycle. I got a bicycle at about the end of World War Two. And uh, it was a really nice bicycle, but the Schwinn Bicycle Company, none of the bicycle companies had gone back into production of bicycles for civilians. And so the bicycle shop had put one together that was made it look like new, and my parents bought it for me, so I had that bicycle. And uh, so sometimes I rode my nice shiny bike to school. It was a four-year high school, and it was small. Uh, our graduating class was a class of 12, and that was a big class, one of the biggest classes in years. Some years there was only one or two or three or a half a dozen graduates. So. We took the normal coursework that was required for by the state of Kansas for graduation from high school, and uh, nothing, nothing really exciting to talk about. I went to high school, you know. I graduated. I, I, I had good grades. I graduated at the top of the class and. Went on to college from there. Now, what college did you attend from there? That was Bethany College in Lindsborg, Kansas. At when then did you play any sports? I was not a good sportsman. That is to say, I was not a good. I was not a good athlete, and so I was always second string on basketball and football teams in high school. I didn't 
tries for sports when I went to college. I ran a little bit of track, but not anything to talk about, so not, not an important part of my life. What about other extracurricular activities in high school? Clubs? Well, we had a band in high school. As a matter of fact, uh, we didn't have a band when I started, when I was a freshman. I was probably a junior or a senior when a band was organized, and so we had a real genuine marching band, and uh, we did some orchestra presentations. Also, we didn't have a shower. <clears throat> so you just wash up the best you could, and uh, that was it. Then later on, when I was uh, high school age, I got the brilliant idea to build a shower, and so I built one on the back side of a granary where we stored grain. This was an old granary. It was, we didn't even use it anymore. But I built a rack onto the side of that granary and put a 50-gallon drum up there. And it was close to the well, the windmill, where we got our water for our cattle. And so I rigged a hose, a garden hose, from the pump over to the 50-gallon barrel and uh, rigged a sh shower head, which would be kind of like you'd buy for sh water in your garden with, and uh, put that on the 50-gallon barrel and then let the sun warm the water during the day, provided you had sunshine that day. We did most of the time. And so you could go out there and take a nice warm shower. I had side curtains on it and worked out good. It got to where even, even the, my mother and my sister would uh, use that for a shower. So. That was really great. We were we were really really modern, really uptown. You know, we realize now that we're doing this in a house in a on a farm where there was no running water. Whatever water you wanted, you went out and pumped it with a hand pump, or out at the later on a out at the windmill. Uh, we installed an electric pump to pump, to, to run the water pump. Prior to the, having the electric pump, we had the wind to turn the vanes on the wind mill, which in turn moved a plunger up and down, and that's how you pumped your water. And if the wind wasn't blowing that day, uh, you didn't get any water. That you had to have that water for the cattle because right next to the windmill and the water pump was a tank, a round tank, maybe 10 feet in diameter and three foot high, and you kept that full of water for the cattle. But uh, it was big enough that if we didn't have wind for a day or two, there was still water in the tank. Oh, it would be uh, outdoors. Uh, we had, uh, we would use a basin of water, probably this big around, about that high, and shaped like this, a, a big bowl, if you will, uh, porcelain, and pour water into that, and that was your that's what you use to, you know, wash your face and your hands. And we uh, we didn't go bare out there in the open. Uh, 
but you'd put on some clean clothes, some clean shorts, and a clean pair of trousers. And of course, that made plenty of washing for the lady of the house because you changed the clothes every day as we do now, but these were really dirty clothes, full of dust and dirt, grease and grime, and about five times as much sweat as what you would uh, gather today. <laughs> we had a washing machine. It was uh, a round tub and uh, the ringer up on top, you know, two, two rubber ringers, one here and one here, and they turned the crank and the clothes would go in between those two rubber ringers um, to wring the hose, wring the water out of the clothes. And uh, we had an electric, not an electric, a gasoline-driven motor to run that washing machine. It was a motor that had a Maytag nameplate on it, a Maytag motor. Before we had the Maytag motor, we would do it by hand. There was a little handle on the side of the tub, and so when you washed your clothes, it was a matter of agitating the water with by hand, the, the inside of the tub was had the same parts when when we did it with our hands as it, it had when we did it with the electric motor. The principle was the same, so and we could hear our neighbors a mile away on a still day, we could hear their Maytag motor on their washing machine, so we knew when they were washing clothes, and they knew when we were washing clothes. <laughs> I belonged to 4-H. As a matter of fact, the 4-H club that I belonged, belonged to was organized while I was a boy, and so I was in on that from from day one, and uh, we showed I my projects were always livestock, mostly uh, cattle, beef cattle. So we'd show those at the county fair, and one year I went on with an animal to Wichita to a regional fair competition, and uh, we'd always sell the cattle at the end of the year, and the industry, the businesses would pay premium price for 4-H livestock just to help the boys and girls out, you know, so that was made it worthwhile. Did you learn a lot? Oh yeah, learned a lot. And what were your plans after high school? What were your plans after high school? My plans after high school? Well, I wasn't going to go to college. My parents talked me into it, and I, I did. So I had a curriculum, chose a curriculum in mathematics, which didn't excite me all that much. Then after a couple of years in uh, the Army, I, during that time, uh, during that time in the Army, I became interested in engineering, and so my math came back to life, and I decided that electrical engineering would be something I would like, and so that's what I went for. Yeah, they thought that would be a good idea, because they, they, they were 
pushing me to go to college. I shouldn't say pushing me to go to college. That makes it sound the wrong context. They would have liked for me to go to college because, and what they had, what they would like to have seen, would uh, was that I would uh, be a school teacher, teach school during the winter months, and that leaves the summers free for farm work. There were a lot of people that did that in that generation, and uh, it worked quite well. You teach school nine months of the year, you know, farm in the evenings and so forth during that time. Uh, and uh, during the summer months, when school was out, that's when the real farm activity was going on anyhow. So it was a nice combination. It didn't really interest me all that much, uh, it, but it was just the only thing I really had an interest in. So that's what I was going to do. Well, I, I held off until almost till school started at Bethany. That was my freshman year. In other words, I graduated from high school in May. Uh, didn't apply at Bethany till probably August. Might have been the last day for registration, I don't know. But uh, I told the folks that, uh, okay, I'll, I'll go to college. And we were in the car, the three of us, mom, dad, and I, uh, real quick before I changed my mind again. <laughs> And off, off to enroll. So that's the way that was. And now at Bethany College, how was your time there? Did you live at the college or live at home? No, I, I lived at the college. It was uh, some something like 35 miles away from home. And I had a, had a car so I could go home on weekends. I lived my first year in a dormitory, and uh, the following year I lived in a bedroom uh, in a private home, and then uh, the third year I lived in a fraternity house. So that's the way that was. And when did you when did you meet Cecilia? Met Cecilia during that time. Uh, we started dating my second year of college, and uh, just went on from there. How did you meet her? How did I meet her? Do you remember? Well, yes, I do. Uh, I had met her. I knew who she was as a freshman because she worked in. Uh, John Anderson's drugstore, no relation to me, but uh, he was also from Wyndham, where I went to high school, so he knew who I was, and so he uh, and I would have some, you know, a little conversation, uh, hello, John Anderson, and that kind of thing. So she was working there, so I, I knew that there was some gal by the name of Cecilia working at John Anderson's drugstore. But uh, we had mandatory chapel in those days at this Lutheran institution. And they had seat assignments so that uh, some of the faculty were proctors who checked your seat every day to see if you were in it. But you were only allowed so many skips in a semester. And so my seat was next to hers, and we, I, I pretty much ignored her. But she had, we'd, we would sing songs out of the hymnal, and she would insist on holding the hymnal over where I had to sing also. 
I didn't want to sing. <laughs> but uh, that's as close as I, I knew her that first year. And the second year, uh, we, I also met her, got to know her better through this mandatory chapel, which was in a different building that second year. And I sat behind her and uh, just, you know, we became at ease with each other. And so that was it. <laughs> I can tell you that it, uh, we were up on Coronado Heights. I had driven the car up there and uh, a, a quick little smack, and that was the end of it. Not, not much enthusiasm on the part of either one of us. <laughs> what do you want to tell us about K-State? Well, that's where I went to school for three years. Uh, got my electrical engineering degree. Cecilia and I were married. Uh, we had Darcy uh, as a new baby during those three years. And he was born about a year after we were married. Less than a year, actually. Uh, he was a honeymoon baby. <laughs> and so we lived in a what we called a trailer house in a trailer court. I think they call them mobile homes now. Uh, it was, we thought, big for that time. It was eight foot wide and 35 foot long. And it was a when we rolled it into the trailer court, new, uh, it was the biggest trailer in the trailer court. Well, I don't think three or four months had gone by till the bigger ones started coming in. They were 10 foot wide, you know, and 50 foot long and made ours look like a midget. But we were comfortable in it. It was very nice. And that's where we lived during the three years that I was studying at K-State Salina, K-State Manhattan, excuse me. Cecilia was a clerk in a uh, women's clothing store for part of that time. And then she got a job teaching in a grade school outside of Manhattan. Uh, and that was good. I had the GI Bill. And that helped us out a lot financially. So we squeaked by and got my degree. And how did the GI Bill, why did you qualify for that, and how did it help you? The GI Bill was just a monthly check that I got because I had been in the military. And uh, if you apply for it to go to school, college, get a college education, you received a stipend from the government. It wasn't real big, but it, it was a big, it was a help, definitely a help. Couldn't have done it without it. There was a lot of education for a lot of ex-servicemen because of the GI Bill. I started out at K-State right after the uh, Korean War truce went into effect. And there were a lot of other servicemen who also were out of the service because of the truce in the Korean War. And a uh, pair of uniform khakis was uh, the dress of the day. You had them when you got out of the service. They still had plenty of good wear in them, and so that's what you wore in school. Khaki trousers. Not a khaki shirt, probably. 
a shirt more like what I've got on or a plaid shirt with khaki trousers. Yeah, Lot, lots of servicemen, lots of, lots of ex-servicemen going to school on the GI Bill. I was drafted it, uh, into the Korean War and uh, I had been in college for three years and I knew that as soon as I graduated from college I would be drafted and uh, that was kind of hanging over me and if, if you will. <clears throat> so I just at the end of my three years, at end of my third year of college, I went to the draft board and I said put my name at the top of the list and they did and a month later I was in the service. And what service did you? I went into the Army. And did you stay here in the United States? I went to, after basic training and some other schooling, I went to Korea. And after a short period of time, our outfit moved to Japan. By that time, the conflict was over. Uh, actually, to, technically, it's still not over because we have never signed a treaty with the North Koreans. But there was a ceasefire, let's say. And so I was drafted after the ceasefire. And so my time in the military was Although it was in Korea and Japan, it was in uh, an office type job. And where did you go for basic training? I went to Fort Riley, Kansas, which is only an hour. hour and a, at that time, the roads weren't like they are today. You know, it was maybe more like an hour and a half, two hour drive from the farm. Military basic training was four months, I think, and then I I went to school, an army school, and that was also at Fort Riley, and so I went several months t to that school, and it was known as the Army General School, and uh, we had a little branch off of that school known as uh, aerial photo interpreter, and so that's what I learned, that's what I was trained in, was interpreting aerial photos, looking for enemy trenches, uh, buildings, aircraft, uh, military activity of various types by studying aerial photographs that somebody had flown the day before. Yeah. So that was my job. You could get the driver's license at uh, the age of 14. And by that time I knew how to drive because I had driven around the farm and had it pretty well under control. There were no driver's tests. Uh, you just walked into the county courthouse and uh, signed a book and I, maybe they charged a dollar or something, I'm, I don't remember. And uh, you got your driver's license. No, no learner's permit or just a full, full blown driver's license. And so that was how I got my driver's license. And then I started high school when I was 13 in September. My, I didn't turn 14 until November. So we had sep September, October, November, three months 
of high school without a driver's license. And uh, Dad took me to school the first day in the pickup truck. And uh, the second day, he said, well, I've got some things I need to do, so you go on and drive to school. And I did without a, without a license. And uh, I drove that way for every day after that for three months without a driver's license. Then I got my driver's license. Then I was legal. I continued, of course, then to drive to school seven miles from the farm to Wyndham, where the high school was. And it, it, no, no real big deal. He just did it. Did you have to learn how to parallel park? You just learned that uh, by parallel parking when you had to, you know. No, no lessons in parallel parking. Most of the time we didn't have any opportunity to, or didn't have any occasion to do parallel parking because there weren't that many cars on the street and they were all parked, not parallel, but how would you say it? You go into the stall, you know, like, like you would in, mo in many downtown areas. Yeah. Not too many people that drive around at age 14 now. No, that's true. Did you think you were old enough or mature enough to drive at age 14? Certainly. <laughs> you weren't scared? No. And what did you drive on the farm? A car or? I drove a pickup truck. We we didn't have a big farm truck, uh, you know, a one ton or half ton, and, and later on a three quarter ton pickup truck is what we had, and a passenger car. So I learned on uh, manual transmission, on automatic transmission. There weren't too many of those around. So I, Never, never learned on the automatic transmission until years, years later. How old do you think you were when you got an automatic transmission? Oh, I suppose I was uh, 18, 20 years old by that time, yeah. So basically if you were old enough to reach the pedals, you could drive? Basically, that's it, yes. You had to go out in the field, you know, to bring something out to the whoever was needing a new new part or a, some repair work done or whatever. If you happened to be the one up at the house, then uh, you'd drive out to the field with the, with the part, you know. When I was in grade school, see, we were in World War II from 1941 through what, 1945, 46, I'm not recalling exactly what year the war ended, but bicycles were something you that you. There were no bicycles made for civilian use. Every, everything went to the war effort. And so there was no bicycle available. And then later, I, at the end of the war, I got a bicycle. I uh, bought it at a Swin bicycle shop. And uh, it was not a new one, but it had been reworked to where it looked like new, and so that was my bicycle. Why wasn't it a new bicycle? Well, the new ones hadn't, uh, the manufacturers hadn't geared up for building new bicycles at that time. They, 
still winding down from the war effort and hadn't geared up for civilian needs, whether you know whether it was a bicycle or an automobile or a tractor or whatever it was, they just hadn't made the changeover to civilian usage, civilian needs yet. So you couldn't get a new bike because all the materials were being used or, or the bike manufacturer was producing? He might have been producing some bicycles for the war effort, but he might probably in all likelihood was building something else that was more important for the military, whatever it was, you know. The military needed a lot of equipment of various types, so manufacturers who were building bicycles or automobiles were all of a sudden building what they, whatever they could, whatever they could get a contract for to build something for the military. One of the things that I remember most was rationing of important products. Gasoline was rationed. Tires for automobiles was, tires for any piece of equipment was rationed. Uh, sugar was rationed. And uh, there were some other things that were rationed, and I don't remember what they were, but uh, the, the rationing on gasoline, I can remember a little bit. Uh, they had You had a little sticker about this big that you put on your windshield of your car, and depending upon your need for gasoline, you got a different letter on that little decal, and the letters was A and B and C, and I guess A was the most important. You could get more, buy more gasoline with an A sticker, excuse me, buy more gasoline with an A sticker than you could with a B sticker than you could with a C sticker, and so that's how that. Who would get an A? The farmers because of their tractors, they needed more gasoline than somebody that lived in town. Uh, there was a lot of carpooling in town, pe people that lived in the city, to save on the gasoline. And uh, truckers, I'm sure, got a A allocation like a farmer would, you know, and uh, just depended upon your need and what you were doing to contribute to the war effort. If you were doing something that needed gasoline, driving some vehicle that needed gasoline and it was a critical occupation for the war effort, you got more gasoline than somebody that just went out for a Sunday drive. That's the Ford, Model A Ford. For Model A Fords were built uh, for about three or four years, from about, uh, say, 1928 through 1932 or 33. And uh, we bought a used one for me to drive to high school. So I would have been, uh, let's see, didn't have one when I was a freshman in high school or a sophomore. Maybe when I was a junior or senior, we bought a used Model A Ford Coupe and uh, had to do a little repair work on the engine, you know, and paint it. And that's what I drove to high school then the last two years, I guess it was. I also drove it one year, my first year of college, 
I drove the Model A to college. And uh, that that's my story of the Model A, yeah. Did you ever have to drive your sister to school? What? Did you drive your sister to school? Sorry. No, she was five years younger than I, and so we were not in high school together. Never had to drive any neighbors or? No, yeah, there was a, a neighbor boy about my age that uh, rode with me. And then my, there were two girls, my cousin and a friend of hers that lived fairly close to us. And so they would ride to school with me. Three people in our Model A coupe, you know, the three in a seat that was built of a car that was built for two. But we were small people, so it, it, it worked out. Well, was there enough seat belts for everyone? <laughs> seat belts? Uh, no, you know, we didn't have any seat belts. No seat belts. Never heard of a seat belt at that age. Seat belts didn't come into being till, wow, till I was maybe 20 years old or older, 25, but I don't really know when seat belts became a requirement. Natural gas. Okay, well, we had an oil well near the barn, not too far from the barn, not too far from the house. And it uh, made a lot of noise because the engine was one that went pop, 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 you know, but we got used to it. And the house that I told you about, we, we had neighbors not very far away, and he was an oil pumper. They piped natural gas from the well over to his house. You know, he was an oil well employee employed by the company that had the well that was back of the barn there. And so they gave him free gas, free natural gas. And since it was the, the gas line went right by our house, within a few feet of our house, they just tapped off and, and run a line over to our house. So we had free natural gas also, full of sulfur. And so if sulfur would uh, be yellow in color, and uh, every year we'd have to paint the kitchen and the, the, because that's where the heating stove was, and uh, sulfur coated the walls and the ceilings and so forth yellow, so we'd paint the walls every year, but we had free gas, free heat. Worked wonderful. We were happy. So did your mom cook on that stove or just heat? She cooked on it. Well, we had two different stoves, one for cooking and one as a space heater. Yeah. We, we had electricity before we had the natural gas, as I recall it. Yes, I'm, I'm sure that's true. We did not have electricity when I was uh, real young. Electricity came through probably about 1940, maybe. I would have been like eight years old. So well, prior to that, we lived with uh, lanterns and, and kerosene lamps, and that was our light at night. You got a refrigerator. We got a refrigerator, yes. Uh, I'm not sure how soon after we got electricity, we, but after we got electricity, we got an electric refrigerator, yes. Prior to that, we had uh, an ice box with ice in it to keep things cool. So how did you feel about getting an electric refrigerator? 
Oh, that was right uptown, you know. Real nice, real fun, real good. What did your mom think? Oh, yeah, she was the one that enjoyed it the most, you know. Did you have a natural gas fired refrigerator? No, we did not have a gas fired refrigerator. Never did. There, those were available, but uh, we never had one. Yeah, we had a wood stove. That is to say, it, it was a, a metal stove that burned wood. How's that? <laughs> Cast iron stove with a door on the front of it. And you put uh, kindling, chunks of wood, you know, a foot long, 18 inches long, different diameters in there, and uh, heat the house with wood and cook with wood. Wood, wood cooking range and uh, wood uh, heating stoves. She had a, the cooking range in the kitchen and a heating stove in the living room. Was that a chore of yours to make sure there was wood? Yes. Yeah. I, uh, Dad chopped the wood. That is to say, what we had was small logs one foot, 18 inches long, and the diameter of uh, whatever that tree happened to be, you know, six inches, 10 inches, 15 inches diameter. And those had to be split into smaller chunks of wood. And, and that was done with an ax. And I was not old enough to wield an ax accurately, I'd probably chop my fingers off, you know. The dad chopped the wood and put it in a pile and then, yeah, I would then bring the wood in as we needed. It was not a job that was specifically assigned to me. Dad would do it if he or mom would do it, just whoever not not specifically assigned to anybody, but I did I did carry carry in wood, yes. Then your dad must have been thrilled with the natural gas heater. Oh yeah. That was a step up. Oil was discovered on my grandfather's farm. It was what they call a wildcat. They'd just go out and drill a oil well in an area where, they're think, where they think there might be oil. <clears throat> and they hit oil on my grandfather's wildcat well. And it was a gusher. By gusher, I mean it under pressure down in the ground. The oil shot straight up in the air, uh, probably as high as the oil derrick, which would be on up there uh, 100, 150 feet. And there's guys running around trying to cap it off, covered with oil, you know, black as the ace of spades. And they, they did get it shut off after a day or so. That was the start of. Uh, the oil, what, the, what we referred to as the oil pool, and that was the, known as the barn, Bornholt Pool, because there were some people by the name of Bornholt that lived in that area. And so that resulted in the oil industry right there where we lived. Uh, little Stores popped up, a couple, three places. Uh, we had one right across the road from where we lived. Gas, uh, gas pumps out front, so you could buy gas for your car. Uh, kind of like a convenience store that we know today, because there was a building that sold all of the kinds of things that are sold at convenience stores today. And, uh, you know, if you ran out of uh, bread or 
whatever it was, milk. You usually went to town on Saturday to do your shopping, but if you ran out in the middle of the week, you could go to these little stores and buy your bread and your milk and whatever you needed. So that, that kind of industry, not industry, but that, that kind of situation popped up overnight almost in that area. And uh, a lot of oil workers, guys who were oil well pumpers primarily, and uh, there'd be uh, two or three or four houses together on a tract of land. All of them uh, had oil families living in them, you know. And that went on for years and years until the oil was depleted and the oil industry left. So that was an interesting time. So did that oil, oil well on your grandfather's farm, did that benefit you, your family? It did, yes. Uh, he, granddad, grand, Matson was, uh, John Matson was a, a very generous person. He was, he gave money to worthy causes, Bethany College, uh, his church, uh, other things that I don't even know about, probably. And uh, he made sure his seven children each got an oil check every month, which included my mother. And so, yeah, that helped, definitely. But uh, my mother told Cecilia, let's try that again. My wife Cecilia told me that uh, my mother told her that the check that she got monthly was what put my sister Sonia through college. So that's my oil well story. That's my oil oil patch story. Well, let's go back to the generosity of um, John Matson, your grandfather. You were telling us a story about a war bond that your grandfather gave you? He gave all of his grandchildren a war bond at one time, yes. We were all gathered together at his home for some special occasion, and all of the grandchildren were there, and so he had planned this in, in advance, of course, and had purchased bonds, war bonds, for each of his grandchildren. There were, how many grandchildren were there? Seventeen or something like that. I'm not going to count them now, but there was a number. And uh, I don't remember the denomination, the dollar value, but they were at least $50 bonds and uh, maybe even more. I don't remember. But that's an example of his generosity, yeah. And then when did you cash that war bond? <laughs> Cashed it uh, about the time we bought this house, which was uh, something like 40 years ago. It held on to it. Did it have a lot of emotional attachment for you? Oh, I, I think it did, or I would have cashed it out earlier, you know. My dad liked to hunt duck, and uh, we lived right on the edge of uh, the sand hills. And we didn't have to drive it couple of miles to where we were really in the sand hills and in the sand hills were lots of little ponds, water ponds. And uh, 
we would go over to those water ponds and hunt ducks. Sit, sit and wait for the ducks to come in. And uh, Dad had a duck collar. What do I want to say? Made it sound like a duck. And uh, we'd use that sometimes. And it was cold. Most of the time when we were hunting duck, we would be down in a depression in the sand where the ducks couldn't see us. And uh, sometimes we had pretty good luck and we'd bring home a few ducks and we'd, we'd fix them at home to eat. And we did that for a few years. Now, did you fix the duck or? No. What do you have to do to fix a duck? Not a lot different than fixing a chicken. You pluck the feathers and dress them out and uh, fry them in a frying pan or bake them in an oven. So did your mom do that or did your dad? Mom did most of it. I think dad would pick the feathers. Well, this was on uh, what was known as uh, Plum Street Road, which was a road that uh, originated in the town of Hutchinson, and then we were 16 miles north of Hutchinson on that road that continued out of Hutchinson on, and it was Plum Street Road. Plum Street Road crossed the Little Arkansas River right there where our farmhouse was. Uh, the bridge was probably uh, 150 yards away from the house. And uh, they, when the bridge was built, it was aligned with the riverbed, which then meant that it was a, a curve in the road so that the road would align with the bridge. And uh, that was uh, enough of a curve that it was dangerous. And there were a number of automobile accidents at that spot as I was growing up. And I can remember Dad, uh, I, I would get up in the morning, I would have slept through an accident, but he would have been involved in pulling injured people out of wrecked cars. I think maybe on a, one or two occasions there were some deaths involved and those accidents, uh, best of my recollection, always happened at night. People just taking the curve too fast. Later on they realigned the road and the bridge so that the road and the bridge so that uh, they were straight and that eliminated that problem. Uh, from my grandfather's house, we lived probably no more than a quarter of a mile. And uh, Which side of the river was he on? It was on the opposite side of the river. We'd simply go out on that road I was just talking about, Plum Street Road, uh, cross the bridge and drive a few hundred yards on south and up into my grandfather's driveway. It was a long driveway to up to a house that was on a high spot, a, sand, a sandy hill. So, Was there a walking bridge? Well, if you mean it, was there a separate lane for walking, no. You walked on uh, the same roadbed that cars went on. We didn't often walk over there. We always drove. I don't, the only time I ever remember actually walking the bridge is maybe if I wanted to go fishing on the other side of the river, on the other bank, I, I might 
go up on the bridge and walk across, but walking across the bridge was something I seldom did. If you didn't have beef, like I talked about earlier, in the cold storage locker in town, uh, then you had to find some other source for meat. And so chicken was the other source for meat. And you always had the, op the option to p of picking one chicken at a time. And you didn't have to worry about, I've got such a big chicken here, I can't eat it all at one time, so what am I going to do with the rest of it? None of that. You know, one, one chicken feeds a family of, we were a family of four, mom, dad, my sister, and I. And uh, one chicken would do very nicely. There might even be some left over for the next meal. Fishing on the Little Arkansas River. Of course, like I've said, the Little Arkansas River was right adjacent to our farm house, so it was easy to go down to the river and fish for a while. And we used worms for bait. So the first thing we'd have to do is I, I would go out where I knew the worms were in the ground and dig out a can of worms, you know, half a dozen worms, a dozen worms, put them in the tin can with, along with a little moist dirt, and that was my bait. And so then I would grab a fishing pole and go down to the river and fish. And to start with, when I was younger, I didn't have any really good fishing equipment, I would cut a pole from a tree, try and find as straight a pole as I could. It would be six, eight, ten foot long. Tie a string to the end of it. Put a hook on the uh, other end of the string and have a cork or a floater to float on top of the water. So here's the cork or floater and down in the water was a string with the hook on the end of it and a worm on the hook. And you'd wait until the fish were biting and you'd see the cork bob up and down and you knew that something was biting on the bait and if then the cork would go under and you knew that fish was swimming away with the hook and you'd give a little yank and if you were lucky you caught a fish. And that's the way we did it. What kind of fish? Catfish, mostly. Sometimes a perch, some perch, some fish. What time of year? In the uh, nice part of the year, we didn't do go fishing in the winter time. First of all, there'd be ice on the water in the winter time, most of the time, and uh, so it was spring and fall, mostly in the spring. Summertime, it would be too hot and uncomfortable to really enjoy fishing and besides that in the heat of the summer we were probably out in the field working somewhere but uh, if I were lucky I would catch a half a dozen fish in different lengths. That was a big one in this little river and uh, bring them home. Fry them for supper. Mom would fry them for supper. Yeah. Most of the time I went by myself, yes. Never went with Sonia or your mom or your dad? No. Sometimes with dad. Sonia was not a f fisherman, 
fisher. Where, how do you say that when you got ladies fishing? Is that a fish, fisher lady? <laughs> my mom, she didn't like to fish. Although I have heard that uh, when they were newlyweds in the few years before I was born, that mom would go down to the river and fish while dad was working in the fields. So I know that she did that, but uh, she, I don't think she really liked it. We had a dog. Uh, it was not, we had several dogs, not all at the same time, but they were not cattle dogs. As a matter of fact, I'm, I'm not, I don't have any special recollection of the dog going along with me to get the cows, although they may have on some occasions. I just don't, I don't remember that. No recollection of dogs with me getting the cows. Mm -hmm. The horse in the river. Well, we had a horse, and his name was Dewey. And he was kind of old, but uh, a good saddle horse. A good horse uh, for herding cattle. I, I had been told, although we never used him for that. Anyway, we lived on the Little Arkansas River, or near the Little Arkansas River, like I have told you. And when the cattle or the horse were coming home from the pasture, they had to cross the river. And the river was muddy, muddy banks. And so one day, Dad, I wasn't in on this, so I don't know firsthand, but the, what Dad told me was that uh, he went out to uh, get the cattle, and when he went down to where they normally cross, the horse, Dewey, was in the mud and his nostrils and his were down in the mud and dad thought he was dead. So what you did with a dead animal is you called the rendering works that would send out a truck and they would pick the animal up and bring it into their rendering works and, and I don't know what they did with dead animal carcasses but whatever they do or did with dead animal carcasses they were going to do that with old Dewey. So the truck came out and they went down to the river and Dewey wasn't there. <laughs> he wasn't dead. <laughs> He was just resting for the next big struggle to get out of the mud, you know. <laughs> but that's the story. No dead horse. So you think that Dewey was resting and, and then got himself out of the mud? Yes. A little embarrassing for my father, but a happy time at the same time, you know. Happy because? He still had his horse. Were horses expensive? I have no idea. We didn't deal in buying and selling horses, so. Yeah, I've got a story to tell you about BB guns. Uh, I wanted one for Christmas. I was in grade school. I don't remember what age I was, but I was probably in the 6th, 7th, 8th grade, somewhere in there. 
It was before the eighth grade. Let's say sixth grade. Just uh, that's that would be my concept. And so, sure enough, uh, I got my BB gun for Christmas. And we had our Christmas exchange on Christmas Eve, pretty early in the day, pretty early in the afternoon. Early enough that it was still light out, so I can remember going out and shooting the BB gun then, that evening. And uh, every boy needed a BB gun. Every boy needs a BB gun in this day and age. You know, it's just one of those things. You gotta have a BB gun. Did the BBs, were there BBs packaged with the BB gun when you opened the Christmas package? Were the BBs packaged with the BB gun? Uh, no, as a matter of fact, they weren't. Uh, Dad had them in his pocket, and uh, I didn't know that he had, that they came in tubes about this long, a tube about this, this big around, about this tube about the size of my finger, I guess. And uh, so I didn't know he had a whole tube of BBs, and he, he gave me a few of them, and so I put them in the BB gun and went over to, and I went out and shot them. And then I said, I'm out of BBs, and then he gave me some more. And then after that, he gave me the whole tube. So that's how he did it. That must have been, you must have been overjoyed to see the whole tube. Oh, yeah. You bet. Well, now, I have another note here, and I have to ask you, who is Avis? Avis Gregerson was my father's cousin. And she lived in Chicago and later in California. But when she lived in Chicago, she would occasionally come and visit us. And she would, us, uh, being my mom and dad and my sister Sonia and myself, and uh, she would sometimes send us birthday gifts through the mail. I, th I think she always brought something with her when she came to visit. And she visited us two or three times when I was growing up out on the farm. And uh, then later when I and my family lived in Littleton, Colorado, when I was working for the Martin Company, she visited us at that location. She had been to visit mom and dad back in Kansas and then came over to Littleton, Colorado and visited with us for two or three or four days. I was working, so Cecilia and Avis would go out uh, downtown Denver and that kind of thing, uh, like you do when you have guests. Uh, nice lady, wonderful lady. Uh, she was uh, a photographer in uh, the medical field, particularly skin diseases, and uh, she took a lot of pictures of a lot of skin. And she was actually named a fellow in, the, uh, in a society called something like American Society of Medical Photographers. So she was very good. And she would take a lot of pictures just for fun when she visited with us, when she came to see us. Very good pictures, yes. Do you have any of those pictures? Yes, I do. I don't have them handy. Right. Can't show them to you now. But they're in scrapbooks, and mostly in scrapbooks here in the house.
did I ever milk a cow? <laughs> I milked many cows, yes, we milked cow. We had a herd of cattle uh, primarily for milk and uh, cream, and we'd have to milk the cows, Dad and I, every morning and every evening. And there were, we milked by hand because we did not have uh, an electrically operated milking machine, since we didn't have electricity, and so we would milk the cows, uh, as I said, by hand, and then later on, after we had electricity, not immediately, but later on we did get an electric milking machine. serve in World War II? No. Why not? I was too young. I was, uh, see I was born in 32, we entered World War II in 41 when the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor, so I was nine years old. And the war was over in 45 or 46, whatever, and uh, I was still too young. They, they were drafting men for the military, but I was too young for the draft. And what about your dad? Was he old enough? He was, yes, if dad was born in uh, 1900. Two, and so in 1941, he was what, four, about 40 years old. Uh, they weren't picking men at that age. Had we had a real need for more men in the military, he might have been drafted. Uh, he he had a draft card. He had registered with the uh, draft board, as I recall. I'm not real sure that that, that, that is true, but uh, he was at the upper end of the age group at any rate. So you were too young and your dad was a little too old. Right. Personally, I did not know any. Uh, People who had parents who had sons in the military flew a flag or hung a flag in the window with a star on it to indicate that they had a son and if they had two sons in the military that would be two stars and so forth. And if one of their <clears throat> sons had been killed in action, the gold, that would be a, a gold star. And there was a club or group uh, known as the Gold Star Mothers, whose sons had been killed in action in the, during the war. We had a flag like that in church for all of the church members, men who, and some women too, uh, there were nurses and women didn't play the role in the military that they do today, but there were some women who had some part in the military. So it, I say men, 95% men, you know, uh, but each church would have their flag on display up front somewhere with uh, one star for each of the church members that were in the military. And if one of them had been killed, then, one, then there'd be the appropriate number of gold stars amongst the blue stars. 
Do you have a flag like that hanging in your house? Now? I have a flag like that hanging in my house now, yes, because we have son David who is in the military. And uh, it hangs on our front window. And it's not a gold star. No gold stars. Thank goodness. Well, I went into the service when I was about 20 years old, and uh, my parents were still living on the farm when I le left home. Uh, then they moved to another farm a few years later, about five miles away from the first farm. And so those are the two places my parents lived. I never lived on this second location because by that time I was married to Cecilia and uh, my parents were living at home and my sister was still living at home. Back to the farm, the original farm where I was wasn't born there, but <laughs> where I came home from the hospital to. Uh, that was on the river, the Little Arkansas River. And uh, from the farmhouse, which was up on a knoll, down to the stream of the river, the Little Arkansas River stream, was probably no more than a couple of hundred yards. So I'd go fishing. That's one of the things I did as a young man, a boy go down to the river and fish for mostly we caught catfish mud, mud cats we called them and sometimes uh, we'd catch some sunfish or perch and they'd range in size from anything worth anything over six inches long was worth keeping and there was no limit on length that it had to be you know 12 inches long before you could keep it or anything like that so we kept the little ones and we kept the big ones the big ones maybe, maybe was if you caught a fish that was 12 15 18 inches long that was a big fish in this little river and so of course when you catch the fish well then you'd have fish for supper didn't have to pluck any feathers on the no, fish. No feathers to pluck, no. We did. Take the, I want to say butcher, what do we do? What would you call that? Take the innards out of them. I, I did that. Uh, Mom didn't like to do that. So we'd, I'd clean them up for her the best I could, and bring them into her to fry. And I also did some hunting and a little bit of trapping on the river as there was coons and possums, muskrat there. I didn't catch very many, but did, did enough, did a lot of trapping for not very many animals. But uh, if, if we, I occasionally was able to sell a pelt or two, skin it and dry it and take it to town and sell it for 50 cents or a dollar, something like that, if it was a good muskrat. You got more for muskrat than you did for possum, for example. But that was big money for a little boy, you know. I remember one conversation that my father had with uh, a gentleman that lived nearby 
They were out in our barn working with the cattle. I don't know what they were doing, but they were talking about what they would like to be, what branch of the service they would like to be in if they got drafted. And uh, I think uh, one of the two men, maybe my dad, said uh, they'd like to serve in tanks because tanks to them at that time seemed like a rather protective piece of equipment. And uh, that to them at that time, a tank would, being in a tank would not be as dangerous as walking on foot, for example. So they talked about that. That's the only little conversation I remember. But there was some concern about if the war drug on, that uh, they would end up going. See, at the beginning of the war, uh, changing the subject very, just very slightly, at the beginning of the war, most of the soldiers were volunteers, young men, 18 years old. Some of them lie about their age, and they were really only 16. And uh, they went into this army, navy, whatever. And uh, that's where we drew our forces from at, at the beginning of the war. Then, as the years went by from 41 through 45, uh, that source of manpower uh, became less, and then the, the draft system really took effect. And when your draft when draft number came up, you went, you know. That's the way it was. There was a Navy base in, south of Hutchinson, but this was not the Navy that you would think of when you say the word Navy. This was air, be like Air Force, the Navy Air, Naval Air Force, perhaps. And you would always, during the daytime, you would always see at least one airplane in the sky and they were practicing. And uh, I would sometimes see an airplane towing a glider, because we used gliders in Germany when we invaded Germany. And these were practice runs for that kind of thing. Uh, I, I remember seeing some, I guess you'd have to call them experimental aircraft. They were uh, a wing, a winged aircraft. There was no fuselage, you know, about this direction, and then wings like this. It was just one big wing, and uh, I saw a few of those flying from the Hutchinson Naval Air Station. Now, you know that uh, there was no TV and there was no video games. We had our first TV when I was uh, maybe 10 years old, 15 years old. I, I, don't, I don't know. You caught me flat-footed on that one. but And, of course, it was black and white. And uh, But before the TV came the radio, we had a did not have radio until my sister Sonia was born. About that time, we had our first radio, and it was a console, a wood console that stood probably three or four foot high, and uh, maybe three foot across, two and a half, three foot across, and about 12 inches deep, and uh, powered by a battery, a car battery. Yes. And uh, then 
after a short period of time, dad got tired of the battery running down and ended up have to take it to town with him the next time we went to town to shop and, and have it uh, charged. So he bought uh, a battery charger, but he was only able to buy the battery charger because by that time we had electricity. See, the more I talk, the more I think of things. Electricity came when I was probably eight, nine years old, just before World War II. So what did you do before electricity? Well, you know, a good old lamp, lantern, used kerosene uh, to uh, light a wick, turn the wick up with your thumb and your finger, you know, a little glass chimney, and that was what you used for light. Had to get your homework done when it was still light, otherwise it got kind of kind of hard to do. So, so then anyway, you... then came the electricity, then came the battery charger, and then Dad could charge the battery, the car battery, that powered the radio. Just black and white TV. Well, you had to have your own antenna up on the roof because there was no cable. First of all, we lived in the country, and that was, you know, 15 miles, 16 miles from town. And so they didn't have cable service out to the farm, but you had a rooftop antenna. And you could pick up uh, a couple, three stations if you lived in the right spot. So. What were your favorite programs? I don't remember. <laughs> okay. Okay. There, were, there were lots of news programs uh, like there are today. News programs were important. Uh, there were quiz shows and they, they were and music. Lawrence Welk was the big thing at that time because he had put on a pretty good program, real good program. <laughs> and uh, that, those, are, those are things, about all I can remember off the top of my head, yeah. Do you ever watch Jack Benny? Oh yeah, yeah, but Jack Benny and uh, Abbott and Costello, yes, yes. The more we talk, the more I can remember, see. There were some children's programs that uh, came on in the evenings after the school hours. Uh, the Lone Ranger and Captain Midnight and uh, others that uh, they were 15 minutes in length and uh, had to listen to those if I could, but always managed to. Uh, the timing was bad. Because it was always time to milk the cows when when, it, when the radio programs came on, so sometimes I'd have to leave the radio programs to go help Dad milk the cows, feed the chickens, gather the eggs, uh, separate the milk from the cream, uh, go feed the milk that you'd separated from the cream to feed that milk to the calves, and uh, those were some of the chores. Sometimes they had to go out in the pasture and drive the cattle home because they hadn't come home. Well, why do they need to come home? They need to come home to get milked twice a day, milk the cows twice a day. You bet. Did you have to feed them? Well, yes, uh, if the cattle were out on pasture, in other words, during the month of the year when the grass was growing, spring, summer, fall, uh, 
they'd get enough to feed to eat out in the pasture, but we'd have to feed them during the winter time from a stack of hay that we had stacked near the cattle pen. And uh, then, of course, when it came time to milk the cows, we would, in a box, wooden box, we would pour a small amount of grain, uh, and that was to lure the cattle into the stall so that we could uh, milk them in the barn. You didn't milk them out in the middle of the corral, you milked them in the barn. Well, we had a field of alfalfa in the field that was right near the river. And the, after a big rain, sometimes we would have a flood. And we had a flood, and it covered the alfalfa field. And when the water went down, then on the alfalfa plants themselves were just a lot of dust. It would have been like silt from the flood. And we, it was time to cut the alfalfa and stack it. And so we went ahead and cut it and stacked it. Dad was in the stack and I was out on the tractor with a rake, a sulky rake, uh, bringing the alfalfa up to near the stack. And Dad was in the stack all day long and he breathed too much dust, so he got dust pneumonia. And it was uh, also harvest time, wheat harvest time. And I was out working with the tractor, and I ran the tractor into a pipe that was a, a small culvert down an oil lease road. And I bumped into that pipe, ruined the tire. And uh, for whatever reason, I decided I should check with Dad before I went out and bought the new tire. I was only like, you know, 14 years old or something like that. <coughs> and uh, I, I drove into town. At that time, I was, you know, 14-year-old farm boys drove into town if you needed to drive into town. That about a 20-mile trip. Dad was in the hospital in town. And uh, the only story about that is that I had this tire in my hand walking down the hospital corridor, going down to my father's room to talk about the new tire. You know, what should I do? Where should I go? What? Uh, where should I buy it? And that's it. But what did he say when you walked in with a tire? Oh, I don't remember. No nurses came after you, or no, no. I anybody can walk down a hospital corridor with a tire in their hand, you know, no big deal. <laughs> remember Pearl Harbor Day, December the 7th, very well. It was a Sunday. We had a radio, and I don't know how we first heard about it. Maybe somebody called us on the telephone, or maybe we just were listening to the news on the hour or something on the radio, but we learned of the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. And I was scared. You know, you're, you're what, nine years old? And what's going to happen next? And will they 
get into the middle of Kansas. I had a plan all mapped out in my mind where I was going to be up in the second floor of the house with my 22 rifle ready for them. <laughs> Kids will dream up things like that, you know. Cecilia and I were married in 1955. That was the year I started school at K-State Manhattan. After I graduated from Manhattan with my degree in electrical engineering, we spent a year in Washington, D.C. with uh, REA, the Rural Electrification Administration their telephone engineering division. Uh, from there to Denver, to what was known as the Martin Company, later Martin Marietta, and spent five years there. Then two or three years up in Montana with the uh, Department of Interior, uh, Bureau of Reclamation, uh, helping with uh, the building, the supervision of construction of Yellowtail Dam on the mouth of the Bighorn River. Uh, four generators, generating capacity of 62 and a half megawatts each. And from there to Salina where we have lived since. Uh, spent my last 14 years uh, uh, before I retired at uh, Kansas State University, Salina, teaching uh, electronic engineering technology. So that's kind of a fast pass at my career up until I retired retired about almost 10, almost 10 years ago and have done some consulting work since then but not a lot and uh, just keep busy doing all kinds of things. I don't, I don't know how I ever found time to work. So that, that's a fast, I hope fast, pass through things sequentially in chronological order. So what brought you back to Salina? <laughs> well, of course, this area is home. Cecilia, born and raised in Lindsburg, which is just 15, 20 miles down the road. I was born and raised at Wyndham, which is about an hour's drive down the road. Our parents were living on farms there in those two locations. And uh, we were here on vacation. I was still with the Bureau of Reclamation and we were going to move from Yellowtail Dam to uh, Hoover Dam, and in the interim we took some time off and went back here to visit our family. Then while we were here, a person we knew, no, an electrician said, I know a firm here in Salina that's looking for an electrical engineer. I wasn't looking for a job, but I just, I think the last day before we went back to Montana, uh, I decided I'd drop in and talk to them, the engineering firm, the architectural firm actually, the shaver company, and uh, to make a long story short, I ended up here working in Salina. That's how it happened.
we had three boys, Darcy, Darren, and David. They were born four years apart, and uh, they ended up going to the service academies. Darcy, the oldest, and David, the youngest, to West Point. Darren, the middle boy, to uh, the Naval Academy at Annapolis. Presently, uh, David is career military. He stayed in the military and just was promoted to colonel. I'm talking now in 19, 2008, you know, he was promoted in 2007. Uh, Darren and Darcy decided they would try civilian life after their five-year commitment with the military was done. So Darcy is in Texas with Perot Systems and Darren is in Baltimore with uh, Muller and Associates doing heating, ventilating, and air conditioning design. So do you think it was a good choice to come back to Salina? Oh yes, definitely. We were concerned about uh, quality of schools and uh, that we were going to be sending our kids to because there was a lot of people moving into the area for construction of a big project and that's always upsetting community-wise. We just didn't feel real good about that. We knew that Salina had a good solid educational system, so that was a factor, yes. When it was it during my second year, uh, I don't remember the month. School starts in September. This might have been November or something like that. So I asked her for a date, and she said yes. And we went to the movie in the big town of Salina, Kansas, at the Fox Theater, which is now, as we talk, the Stiefel Theater. And uh, we didn't go out for probably three weeks or a month after that. And I asked her out again, and she went uh, with me to probably another movie. I don't know what it was. But uh, yeah, that, that, was, that was how that all started. <laughs>